uh, here in the Boston Terrier. So Darwin pointed out that if a paleontologist found these skeletons, he would definitely have named them different species because of the dramatic changes. And yet these are examples of dramatic transformations that have been achieved uh, by human, uh, human breeders. Okay, so what's actually happened to transform uh, all of these different skeletal structures? Exactly the same sorts of genetic approaches can be used to study this problem as we introduced for the corn on Tiacente problem. So some very interesting uh, genetic experiments have been done trying to look at the genetic basis of uh, producing skeletal differences. One of my favorite uh, forms of this experiment, because it was one of the largest, uh, was done in the 1920s and 30s by a man named Charles Stockard. Stockard got a big grant uh, from the Rockefeller Foundation and used it uh, to buy a farm in upstate New York. So he called this the Cornell Anatomy Farm, and for about a dozen years he got in uh, all sorts of different dog breeds and carried out interesting crosses to try to look at the genetic basis of form and behavior in dogs. So let's look at some of these crosses. It's a cross that uh, Stockard set up between the German uh, Shepherd and the Basset Hound. Again, the German Shepherd has long legs. Uh, Basset Hounds have short legs. The F1 hybrids of this cross also have short legs. That suggests that there may be a dominant factor in the Basset breed uh, that causes short leg length. If you intercross the F1s and make the F2 uh, grandchild generation, the dogs come out with a mixture of either short or tall legs. And even in the small numbers of animals uh, that were generated here in the dog litters, you can see that short and long legs occur in almost a Mendelian 3 to 1 ratio. Again, a dominant trait, so only a quarter of the offspring show the short legs, or the long legs, that are characteristic of the German Shepherd parent. So these sorts of results are consistent with a single Mendelian gene uh, that controls the difference in leg length uh, between uh, these dog breeds. Okay, here's another cross. This one was set up between uh, the Boston Terrier and the Dachshund, the wiener dog. So if you cross these two animals, the F1 hybrid, again, looks intermediate. Looks a little more like uh, maybe the Dachshund than the Boston Terrier. If you intercross the F1s, put the chromosomes together in different combinations, you get very interesting sorts of F2 dogs coming out. <laughs> so this is one of my favorite F2s. It has the tummy blaze of the Boston Terrier. It has ears that are the size and the shape of the dachshund, but they're held in the upright position of the Boston Terrier. <laughs> okay, now, so that already suggests different genes controlling ear shape and ear elevation. But remember something else from the table that we went bore f through before for corn and tiacente. If the traits were controlled by very large numbers of genes, it's almost impossible to get back in a small number of animals any that will show the chromosome types and the traits of the original parents. What's seen here is that very small numbers of animals, you're getting back F2s whose ear shape looks like the dachshund or whose ear elevation looks like the Boston Terrier. And again, that suggests relatively few genetic factors are controlling those different traits. Okay, one last cross. This was one of the more dramatic ones on the Cornell Anatomy Farm. It was set up between the Saluki. So the Saluki is that uh, long muzzle, long limbed dog uh, that uh, we showed earlier in the Egyptian uh, photo. This is actually the skull of a Saluki dog. You can see uh, that it has a very long muzzle, much longer than is present uh, in the Pekingese, which of course is a very short dog, very squashed in face, almost no muzzle at all, and very short legs. This was uh, one of the hardest crosses that was tried on the Cornell Anatomy Farm. <laughs> Again, he was able to generate a few F1 hybrids. They look intermediate uh, between the two parents. So if you intercross the F1s, you get some very interesting F2 dogs come out. <laughs> Turns out that the length of the upper and the lower jaw is inherited independently in the cross. So some of the dogs come out with lower jaws that are longer than the upper jaws. Some of the dogs have good match between the upper and the lower jaw, and then this dog in the lower right has the opposite problem. Its upper jaw is so much longer than its lower jaw that it has a constantly uh, protruding tongue. So again, those are very much like the ear results. It's clear that there must be different genes for different uh, traits, so upper jaw genes and lower jaw genes are different. But it's also clear that you can get shorts and longs coming out on a very small number of uh, F2 animals, which again suggests for a given bone, that the number of genes involved are likely to be small. Okay, so a summary then of a lot of different uh, dog genetics. The genetics of individual traits can be relatively simple. Simple Mendelian gene for leg length, for example. Relatively small uh, numbers of genes likely controlling several of the other differences. At the same time, different genes controlling the growth of different bones. 
And I think it's that combination of factors that makes it possible for breeders to do what they do. There's different genes acting in different body parts. They have major effects on morphology. You can pick a body part that you want to modify, choose, uh, choose variants that occur, and selectively breed from those in order to generate uh, dramatically different forms. So for both Tiacente and for dogs, uh, selective breeding can generate uh, very large changes in a short amount of time. So let's stop there and uh, be happy to take questions. Yeah. Um, for like modern day breeders when they're breeding dogs, do they look a lot at genetics or is it just more physical features that they try to cross, just like pictures? So the question is how much um, molecular genetics guides current uh, dog breeding. I think that the breeders that uh, you saw interviewed here weren't using results from DNA to try to decide the particular dam and sire that they were, uh, that they were going to choose for the next generation. You could do that now. So they're, uh, in an organized program, if you wanted to try to speed the process, you could use molecular markers to try to screen progeny for those that might uh, carry a chromosome of particular interest. But historically, it's all been done based on just looking at animals and choosing phenotypically the ones that have a little more muscle definition in the rear or uh, taller ears or shorter ears, uh, et cetera. Yeah. Um, you said that dogs have different genes that control upper, the upper and lower jaws. Right. Um, is there any evolutionary advantage to um, that? Is there an evolutionary advantage to be able to choose, uh, change different bones differently? So I think the question for uh, jaws is an interesting one because you're worried about the mismatch uh, between the teeth on the upper jaw and the lower jaw, and you would think that normally those two traits uh, would, would go together. In fact, what it looks like, if you look at the amazing variations in bones and patterns that vertebrates are able to achieve, they achieve that because they have a modular genetic control over what's happening in each little bone uh, throughout the skeleton. And that makes it possible to tweak and change cartilage and bone into all kinds of useful adaptations for running and hopping and swimming and flying and chewing and uh, running faster, et cetera. You have to be able to encode those differences somehow in the genome. So it's done by a very scattered genetic system with selection deciding that's a fit combination or that's a fit combination and uh, thereby producing the overall forms that are seen in animals. Uh, I understand like how you get from Tia Sente to the regular maize corn. However, how do you make like different varieties of that corn? And was maize available like back then? Like how did they know what genes that can make the Tia Sente be a maize corn? Right. So again, and Sean got several questions too about whether the mutations and the variations know what they're going to have to become. They don't. So the variation occurs at random in all different directions. It's really uh, either artificial selection by humans or natural selection looking for fit variants that decides out of all of the random variations that occurred, this one uh, is a feature that a human breeder would like or this is one that has survived better, left more offspring. It may only be a small survival difference, five or 10 percent as uh, Sean mentioned, but that random variation and then choosing based on appearance or based on fitness is what generates the different uh, breeds or stocks naturally. And then uh, in modern day times, people are hard at work trying to improve corn yields using uh, all sorts of genetic techniques, including uh, breeding, monitoring chromosomes, and sometimes now inserting genes that might improve resistance to, uh, to pests that uh, consume the crops, uh, et cetera. So the, the modifications we see today are a mixture of old and new techniques, but the old techniques have already been able to achieve uh, remarkable things. Yeah? You'd think that uh, the upper and lower jaw genes would be linked, but uh, they're not. Um, do any problems arise while breeding dogs or, uh, or even corn with uh, link genes? Right, so that's a great question uh, about whether the kinds of mismatches that can sometimes come up in these uh, different dog breeds uh, create uh, problems. That actually uh, is true that there are dog breeds that now have such uh, morphological extremes that uh, if it weren't for humans helping them along, uh, either with food or 